Today I'm going to just talk about parabolas. So we've seen a little bit about these already. Let me see if I can remember what we know already. So uh, I was drawing this standard graph of the parabola in Cartesian coordinates. So that was the equation 4ay equals x squared. <coughs> and when I draw that, so here's, here's our parabola, something like that. Uh, so then there was this point at a, which was called the focus. And then there was this line down at y equals minus a, which was called the directrix. And uh, so then the uh, key property of the parabola, if you have a point P, X, Y on that parabola, uh, so the focus, let's call that F1. And if you project that point down onto the directrix to get a point F2, then the key property was that the distance from the point to F1 is equal to the distance from the point to F2, that closest point on the directrix. And you know my picture, I'm never able to draw that. Um, but, uh, uh, so it doesn't look like it, but uh, that's the uh, Euclidean equation for the parabola. It's points whose distance to a focus is equal to their distance to the directrix. So let me see. Um, everything that we're going to do in the future is going to be more important to know about the parabola, not in Cartesian coordinates with this Cartesian equation, but we're going to want to know about it in polar coordinates. In, and so we want to know what the polar coordinates equation of the parabola is. So I'm going to try and derive that for you uh, right now. So uh, it turns out that uh, to get the, the polar coordinates equation, it's really better to um, turn things around. It's just more convenient for what I what we what uh, we're doing, and it fits the standard convention. So we're just going to rotate it all around like that. Okay, and uh, so now I've got to readjust my labels because they don't look right anymore. Uh, so here was the uh, directrix. So I've still got that same directrix. Let me try and draw it just a little bit closer because that would seem to be working out a bit better. And uh, let me move the axis so that it goes through the focus. Okay, so here's our, here's our sort of new attempt at sketching the parabola. Okay. So uh, I'm going to put uh, that focus F1, that's going to be the origin now when I'm drawing this in polar coordinates. And uh, our point P I'm going to think about that point now in polar coordinates. So there's the line from the origin to P. Ah, so the polar coordinates are R theta, so that just means that angle there is theta. And let's put in a few more coordinates on here. So uh, now that I've shifted the origin, this point where the parabola crosses the x-axis, that's at distance a from the origin. And then the point where the directrix crosses that axis, that's distance 2a. Okay, so, so here's my new picture. It's just the same picture, but I've rotated it and I've shifted one of the axes so that the origin is now the focus. And so then this was the point F2, this uh, projection onto the directrix. And uh, so the condition that we had was that this uh, distance here from P to F2 is also equal to R. So now we should be able to just derive the polar equation because, well, if I were to plot this, if I, if I drop this perpendicular here, then I've got a right angle triangle here, and I know the hypotenuse and I know the angle, so this adjacent side is r cos theta, that's up to there. And uh, so from this picture, 
you see that uh, this distance here, which is this distance here, it's the whole distance from the origin to there, which is 2a, take away that distance. And so right away, I can just write down what the equation is going to be using these polar coordinates. We want the distance pf2 to be r, but the distance pf2 is equal to 2a minus r cos theta. And uh, if I just rearrange a little bit, let me bring the r's over to the left-hand side. And if I factor out an r, that's 1 plus cos theta equals 2a. So that gives me that r is 2a over 1 plus cos theta. So that right there, you see, it's not super difficult to derive it. Just uh, starting from the Euclidean equation, that, there we are. We've derived the polar equation for the parabola. So there it is. This is the polar equation. for the parabola. Good. Uh, so all that was tricky there was, was the, the, the one thing you've got to do is you've got to put the, put the focus F1 at the origin and then everything else is quite straightforward. So maybe you remember from the homework uh, that um, you hopefully tried, um, the parabola has this, this, this beautiful property that if you shine a beam of light at the parabola, that light reflects to the origin. Doesn't matter where you shine the light from, you shine it from up here, wherever it hits the parabola, it reflects to the origin. Okay, so you imagine kind of making that parabola out of some piece of material and coating the inside with, with some reflective material and then you shine your parallel beam of light into the parabola and it focuses that whole light to the origin. Maybe a better way of thinking about it is if you, if you were to put a light source at the origin and shine the light out from the origin, no matter where it hits the parabolic mirror, it's going to reflect into a parallel beam. So all of those are going to reflect into parallel beams of light. So... Uh, you see, this is immediately rather useful, right? If you were to make like a, a car headlight or something like that, and you, you, so this was the kind of casing of the car headlight in the shape of a parabola, and you coat it with reflective material, and then you put the bulb, the light source in that headlight at, that, at the origin there, then that light is going to be reflected out, and it's going to send all of that uh, light from the light source out into a nice parallel beam of light. So it's kind of rather a useful property. So this is the, uh, let's just call this the optical property of the parabola. Okay, so, so I, I asked you to prove that on the homework. It's not super hard to do, uh, to prove that the parabola does indeed have the property I've just explained. So what I want to do to start with today Is to, is to show uh, that the parabola is the only curve with this optical property. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I, so this is kind of the converse of the result you proved on the homework. The homework you proved, if you have the parabola, then it has this optical property. I want to prove conversely that if you have a curve with this optical property, then that curve is the parabola. So this turns out it's quite a lot more tricky to show. And uh, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it using polar coordinates, because this is, this is uh, it, it's usually the case, I find, when you're trying to do something with conic sections, polar coordinates is usually the answer. Okay, so we need to, to get ready for doing that with a little bit of preparation. So let me draw some polar curve. It may or may not be a parabola. I'm not going to assume that. So some polar curve, r equals f of theta. Some polar graph. And I'm going to take some point on that graph, r theta. 
And what I want to do is that I'm going to, um, so uh, that distance is r, and that angle, that's what's going to be important, that angle is theta. And um, then I'm going to um, look at the tangent line at our point to the curve. Okay, so that, that's the tangent. We're kind of used to taking that tangent, so there it is. And uh, maybe we haven't done this before, but actually I'm going to want to look at the normal. It doesn't look quite a right angle, so this is perpendicular to the tangent line. So this line is called, so, so uh, let's label things. This is the tangent. This line is called the normal to the tangent. Okay, so that's a right angle right there. And uh, what I'm going to be interested in is actually that angle right there. I'm going to call it phi. So what can we say? So uh, uh, let phi be the angle between the x-axis and the normal. So now I have theta and phi. Right, so theta is, is the usual angle at the origin to our point, and phi, that's the angle of this normal to the x-axis. And I want to just ponder a little bit what's the connection between these two different angles. Okay, so to understand the normal, of course, I'm going to need to understand the tangent line. So I want to know, to start with, what's the slope? Let's start with the tangent line. In other words, I want to know what is dy by dx, right? That's the slope of the tangent line. But we're in polar coordinates, so uh, I've got to think about how to, how to get x and y out of our curve, right? x is uh, r, which is f of theta cos theta, and y is r, which is f of theta sine theta. Uh, so how do I work out dy by dx, given that? So let's maybe just write so, what, so that we can follow what we're doing. So this is the slope of the tangent line. Okay, so dy by dx, where you're used to this, dy by dx by the chain rule is dy by d theta over dx by d theta. And uh, so do I know uh, dy by d theta? Do I know dx by d theta? Well, I've got to differentiate those equations. Let's start with x. So I've got to take the equation for x, and I've got to d by d theta, both sides. Now, this is not a circle, so this is really a function of theta. So it's two functions times together. So when I d by d theta, I've got to use the product rule. So dx by d theta, it's the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. Now, the derivative of the second is minus sine theta. So it's the first times the derivative of the second. And let me see, dy by d theta, similarly, that's uh, f prime of theta sine theta plus f of theta cos theta. Okay, so that's... Uh, got the ingredients that I need then so now I can do dy by dx it's dy by d theta divided by dx by d theta very good and let me see what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide top and bottom of that fraction by cos theta and then it becomes f prime of theta tan theta plus f of theta over f prime of theta minus f of theta tan theta. Okay, so that's a, that's a kind of totally general formula of how to calculate the slope of the tangent line if you're given a polar graph. But I don't want to think about the tangent line, I want to think about the slope of the normal. So let me see, this normal, it's perpendicular to the tangent line. 
So it's slope, it's minus the reciprocal of the um, slope of the tangent line, right? If you, if you pro, it's minus dx by dy. So I've got to, I've got to take dy by dx and I've got to, got to do minus the reciprocal. So let's do that. I'm going to change this. So this, this denominator is going to become the numerator and at the same time I'm going to change the signs. So on the top I want f of theta tan theta plus f prime of theta, not plus, minus. There we go. I'm minusing both of those things that were on the denominator. Now they're on the numerator. Divided by the old numerator is the new denominator. Okay, so this is the slope of the normal. Uh, and, uh, um, of course, this, so this angle phi, that's the, that's the angle between the normal and the x-axis. So that slope that we've just calculated, that is tan phi, rise over run for that normal line. Right, so that quantity that I've just worked out, that's the tangent of this angle phi, the angle of the normal. And uh, I'm going to just rearrange that equation a little bit. So I'm going to cross multiply. So that's what, what have I got, f prime of theta, tan theta, tan phi, plus f of theta, tan phi. And let me see, I think I'm going to bring the f of thetas to the left. So there's an f of theta, I've got tan theta, lots of it. And then there's another f of theta. So I'm bringing that over to the left-hand side, so it's going to be minus f of theta tan phi. And I'm bringing all the f prime of theta stuff to the right-hand side. So what have I got? I've already got tan theta tan phi, and uh, I'm bringing that guy over to the other side as well. So I, let me write it as 1 plus, because I prefer that. Okay, so I'm kind of getting quite close to what I want. Sorry, this is taking me a little while. So the upshot is that f of the f prime of theta over f of theta is, so let me see if I'm getting this right, it's tan theta minus tan phi over 1 plus tan theta tan phi. So I've just proved this strange-looking equation, which relates the angle theta in the polar coordinates of that point and the angle phi of the normal to the curve. So that's theta and phi appearing on the right-hand side of this equation. Tan theta minus tan phi over 1 plus tan theta tan phi. That's the, the derivative of our function f prime of theta over f of theta. So I realize that looks like a slightly strange looking equation. Uh, let me try and make it look just a little bit easier. So this, this equation relates the uh, angle theta of our point, our theta on the curve, to uh, the angle phi of the normal to the horizontal. Okay, that's the equation we've just derived. But the thing is, the right-hand side is actually very nice. Maybe you don't recognize that formula for the right-hand side. So let me try and uh, explain why I, why I like that. Um, so what you need to know to realize why that right-hand side is nice is you need to know how to expand this sine of a difference of two angles and cosine of a difference of two angles. So these are the multiple angle formulas. You've seen the double angle formulas. Well, these are the multiple angle formulae. 
I don't know if you would have seen them in your trigonometry or not. In fact, there's a question on this, this upcoming homework where you'll uh, prove these formulas. So I'm, I'm just going to take them as fact here. So sine, it's go, sine goes sine cos, and the minus sign stays a minus sign, and then it goes cos sine. As cosine goes cos cos, and cosine flips that minus sign to a plus sign. Okay, so those are the multiple angle formulas, which are kind of famous trig identities. Uh, and if you if you uh, divide those two equations, you get that tan theta minus V is, well, it's a little nasty, sine theta cos V minus cos theta sine V over cos theta cos V plus sine theta sine V. But I want to turn everything into tangent. But really what I'm doing here is I'm deriving the multiple angle formula for tangent from the ones for sine and cosine. So if I take this fraction and I divide top and bottom by cos theta cos phi, so the cos phi's cancel and I get a sine theta over cos theta. So I get a tan theta there. And there's that minus sign. And I'm dividing through by cos theta cos phi. So the cos thetas go and I get sine phi over cos phi, which is tan phi. And the denominator I'm dividing by cos theta cos phi. So I get one plus tan theta tan phi. And you should see what we've got there. Ah, that was that right hand side, which I thought was very nice. If you knew that formula, you would have, you would have seen right away what I uh, was uh, noticing. So the upshot is that actually this ratio f prime of theta over f of theta is actually the tangent of the difference theta minus phi. So there's a sort of equivalent version of that same formula, which is going to be useful. Okay, very good. So that was a little bit of uh, uh, background work we, we had to put in. Now let's go back to the problem in hand. Let me just kind of copy that formula so that I can use it. Remember, theta is the angle to our point, r theta on this curve, and phi is the angle of the normal to the horizontal. So I'm now going to assume that the, the polar graph r equals f of theta has the optical property. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, draw a picture so you, you, you see what, what I'm getting at. So here is our polar graph. I know it looks a bit like a parabola. Well, that won't do us any harm. Uh, I should draw it as a curve, though. So here we go. Let's try it one more time. There we go. So that's the origin. So this is, this, this is the point R theta on that curve. So as usual, that's this, this angle theta. And then we have the tangent line, which is something like that. And then we had the normal. Yeah, that picture's not very great. I wish I was good at pictures. There we go. So that's, we, we, you're gonna have to pretend that's a right angle. So that's the normal, so that's phi. Let's draw the horizontal in there. Okay, so that's that's just parallel to the x-axis. There we go. So being parallel, we've got that uh, z bend there. So that big angle there is another theta. And similarly, we've got that z bend there where that angle is phi, right? So that little angle in there is phi. Now, the optical property, well, let's see if we can see it. So the optical property is that that is light reflecting from the parabola there. So there's the, there's the tangent line. That's the property that that angle and that angle are both equal. Or in terms of the normal, it's the property that 
this normal is exactly bisecting the angle theta. The normal bisects the angle theta. And so that's exactly the property we want this curve to have, so that it, no matter where that light from the origin hits our curve, it reflects so that the reflection is, is, is that ray of light parallel to the x-axis. That's exactly this property that that normal line is bisecting that angle to the horizontal. Uh, and if you think about it just for a little bit, that's exactly the property that this angle phi is exactly half of the angle theta, right? That, that's, that's bisecting. There's phi, there's phi. So, they're, they're, so it's exactly the property that phi is theta over two. Okay, so now I'm, I'm taking any old graph, r equals f of theta, and I'm just assuming it has this property, that it reflects light in this way. So that property is exactly the property that this angle phi, the angle of the normal, is the angle theta over two. And now I'm gonna plug in to our equation up here. This, was, this equation was in general for any f of theta. And now I'm plugging in this special property so I, I, can, I can replace that phi there by theta over two. So I get that f prime of theta over f of theta is tan, what have I got? I've got theta and phi is theta over two. So I've got theta take away theta over two, which is just theta over two. Uh, maybe it looks a little bit better if I, if I uh, write this, uh, remember f of theta, that's r, and uh, uh, so may, maybe I maybe I, sw I switch a little bit to Leibniz -y notation. Instead of writing f prime of theta, that would be dr by d theta in Leibniz -y notation, right? So if I were to do that, then what have I got? I've got dr by d theta. That's my f prime of theta there, and then I've got one over f of theta. So that's one over r is tan theta over two. And so what I've just derived here is the differential equation. It's a first order differential equation for the function r equals f of theta. Okay, so right, this is sort of a, a, a beautiful example of this. I, I basically use the physical law of how light reflects to turn this optical property into this differential equation. And now if I want to find out what the function f of theta is, I've got to solve this differential equation. Okay, but so we've kind of done all the hard work. We've done the, the bit that's usually difficult, which is translating the physics, this optical property, into the math, this differential equation. And then we're just left with doing the math. So let's kind of copy where we've got to. Uh, so actually, this is one way you can just do this separation of variables, which I talked a little bit about a couple of weeks ago. So uh, what do you do? You, you uh, try and put all the R's onto the left-hand side and all the thetas onto the right-hand side. And then you just stick an integral sign on both sides. And I always put a plus C so I don't forget. Okay, so uh, uh, now I've got to calculate these indefinite integrals. Well, the left-hand side, it's natural log of R. I don't know, the right-hand side maybe is a bit more tricky. I don't know if you know how to find an indefinite integral of uh, tan theta. Well, it's theta over two, isn't it? So I guess we'll do theta over two d theta. But it's actually quite an easy one. Tangent is sine over cos. And when I look at this, I see that sine as being something to do with the derivative of that thing on the, on the denominator, that cosine. So I call this sine my friend, and I just ignore it. And just treat it as being, how do I integrate one over, st one over stuff? And you integrate one over stuff by doing ln of stuff. 
So, so this is what I would come up with. I would come up with natural log theta over two as being a candidate for being an antiderivative. But let's then check. So when I differentiate, when I differentiate that, um, that, um, that was wrong, not natural log theta over two, natural log cos theta over two, right? So, so you just treat this as being one over stuff. The stuff is that cos theta over two. The sine theta over two there, that's your friend, because that's to do with the derivative of the stuff, the derivative of that cosine. So that's what I'm going to guess. And when you differentiate that back again to check, you get one over cos theta over two. And then the derivative of the inside gives me negative sine theta over two. And then there's another chain rule. That I get an extra half, right? So that gives me minus a half times what I what I want. So actually, I've got to stick a minus two out the front. There's an antiderivative of tan theta over two. So that's what I've, what I've ended up getting. It's ln, uh, so that minus two comes inside the natural log and becomes to the power minus two. So I can write it like that. Okay, so that, that's found antiderivatives. And let me see, let me do e to the power of both sides. So on the right-hand side, I get e to the power of this times e to the power c and if i if i just if i just rename uh let me maybe use capital a if i just call a e to the power c then when you exponentiate you get a um ooh, a over cos squared theta over two right that natural log disappears when you exponentiate uh okay so now what have we got to do we've got to find a if you remember uh well um, I'm kind of after the parabola where I started. So way, way, way back when we had our parabola in polar coordinates, um, I made that x-axis intercept at little a. So why don't I give myself that as an extra property, little a? So I'm going to assume uh, that should be written uh, here, sorry. I'm going to call that a and I'm going to assume that uh, f of zero is a. So that's really, that's, that, that's an initial condition for solving this differential equation. I'm telling you that f of zero equals a. So if I go here and I plug in theta equals zero, I want r to be little a. But on, so I want little a, and on the right, when you plug in theta equals zero, that's a y r. So that means the big A equals little a. So this unknown constant, capital A, that's just the x-axis intercept of our graph, which I'm assuming is given as being little a. Okay, so this, this, is, this um, is your choice. So we've got a over cos squared theta over 2. Uh, let, me, let me double top and bottom. That doesn't change anything. Those twos cancel. And I'm going to subtract 1 and add 1. And you should see right away why I'm doing that, because on the bottom I've got 2 cos squared theta over 2 minus 1, which is just cos theta by the uh, double angle formula for cosine, and then there's that last plus 1. Right, so let's, let's just write it one more time so you can see it. It's 2 over 1 plus cos theta. Uh, and where did the A go? I missed the A. There we go. The A is sitting there. This is the, exactly the same as the polar equation for the parabola that we derived at the start of the lecture. So this, this completes the proof. Uh, this polar equation is the polar equation of a parabola. Therefore, we've proved that the polar graph r equals f of theta with the optical property is exactly the parabola. There was the uh, equation for the parabola at the beginning. r is 2a over 1 plus cos theta. And look, that's what we ended up with when I solved that differential equation. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the argument. I think it's quite nice. So let's uh, do one more thing today. So um, what have we done so far? I've translated the Cartesian equation for parabola into this polar equation. 
And then I uh, proved the converse of that homework problem that you might have attempted. Namely, I've proved that if you have a curve with this optical property of sending light from the focus to a parallel beam, then the equation of that curve is the equation of the parabola. Let's, let's f finish up by talking just very quickly about the ellipse once more. So I think this is kind of my last uh, breath about uh, conic sections. Um, the, the, the ellipse actually also has a nice optical property. It's not such a useful one, but it's, it's still very nice. So there's an ellipse. So remember, for an ellipse, there's two foci. And so the property for an ellipse is that if you shoot light out of one focus, it reflects to the other focus. No matter where you shine it on the ellipse, it, it reflects light from focus one to focus two. So let's, I'm not going to write down what that is. So this also has an optical property. I'm not going to prove that for you in any shape or form, but what I do want to do is uh, work out how to write the equation. the ellipse. So this is the last thing I'm going to do. So again, I'm going to uh, move the origin to the first focus. So here was f1, f2. So I'm going to, I'm going to move my origin in here. So let's see if I can do that. So that first focus right there is going to become the origin. So that's uh, F1. And then there's F2. And so the focus becomes the origin. That's always the trick when you're doing polar equations for conic sections. Uh, okay, let's see if we can remember a few other things. Uh, so the Cartesian equation was x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. That was a, that was b. And if you remember, that focus was at c, where c was a, e. And oh yeah, there was all this stuff. The e was the eccentricity, which was between 0 and 1. Uh, or in terms of the Cartesian equation, it was 1 minus b squared over a squared square rooted. That's all stuff we've talked about, right? So uh, what does that mean, this coordinate is, this axis intercept? So what have I done? Uh, so that distance, that's the, so I've moved the focus, so that's now the origin. So it's that distance right there. So that coordinate right there is actually a minus c. Uh, or maybe it's better to not write C at all, but write everything in terms of A and E. So it's A minus A, E, which is A, 1 minus E. And uh, what's that coordinate there? Uh, so um, that's, uh, that's that distance right there, right, which is 2C, which is 2A, E. Uh, maybe I should write minus because it's, it's negative. Okay, and now let's think about a point P in polar coordinates on that ellipse. So this now is the Cartesian equation uh, right here, which we've already seen is equivalent to the Euclidean equation. The distance from P to F1 plus the distance from P to F2 is 2A. But now, if P is R theta, the distance from P to F1 is just R. Okay, so what have we got? We've got that P F2 is 2A minus R. I'm going to square both sides. 
So that distance from the point P to F2, it's 2a minus r squared. But I can calculate this quite easily if I drop that little little uh, perpendicular there. I can calculate that PF2. It's the hypotenuse of that right angle triangle. And the hypotenuse of that right angle triangle, let me see, I need to know the height of that right angle triangle, which is r sine theta. That's the height of that right angle triangle. And that is r cos theta. And that, well, that's 2ae. So that gives me that whole bottom side of that right angle triangle. It's 2ae plus r cos theta. So I think that tells me that PF2 squared is r sine theta squared plus r cos theta plus 2ae squared. That length needs to equal 2a minus r squared. Okay, so now I've got to do the I've got to finish off the algebra. Let me foil everything out. I get r squared sine squared theta plus r squared cos squared theta plus 4aer cos theta plus 4a squared e squared is what have I got on the right? I've got 4a squared minus 4ar plus r squared. Okay, I've just about run out of room and I'm just about done. Here, these two guys together, sine squared plus cos squared is 1, so that's r squared. And that r squared cancels that r squared. So I'm, I'm just going to need to just go onto the last piece of paper just very quickly to finish this off. So now I'm left with those terms, and uh, I can divide everything. Everything now has got an a, and everything's got a 4. So if I divide by 4a, I get that e r cos theta plus a e squared is a minus r. Now let me bring the r's over to the left. And the rest over to the right, that's an a, uh, 1 minus, that's, that's just a minus a e squared. So that's r1 plus e cos theta. And here I've got uh, a 1 minus e squared, which is a 1 minus e 1 plus e. So this quantity a1 minus e, I'm actually going to rename that. I'm going to call this R0. We've seen that before, actually, in the graph. That quantity there, that was R0, right? So R0 is that distance from this x-axis intercept to the origin. I'm calling it R0 because it's R when theta is 0. And so now the final equation that I've got is that r, the function that we're after, it's r0, 1 plus e over 1 plus e cos theta, where e is the eccentricity and r0 is the x-axis intercept. So this, that's the polar equation for the ellipse. Okay, and so that's the standard form we're going to use uh, as we move forward here. So let's just glance back very quickly. So keep that equation in mind. R is R0, 1 plus e over 1 plus e cos theta. Let's glance back at the equation for the parabola. Remember, for the parabola, e is 1. So uh, for the parabola, uh, what did we have? We had, hmm, uh, I'll go right back to the very beginning. There was our parabola equation. Oh, for the parabola, e is 1. 
you plug in e equals 1 into the ellipse equation that I got, the 1 plus e becomes 2. That becomes 2r0. What was r0? Oh, r0 was the x-axis intercept. For the parabola, that's just the same as a. Uh, and e is 1, so 1 plus e equals r. So the polar equation for the parabola, hopefully you see that, that's the same equation as the polar equation for the ellipse. It's just that instead of the eccentricity being less than 1, the eccentricity is equal to 1. This a is the same as the thing I'm calling r0, the r when theta equals 0. That's the x-axis intercept for our parabola. So uh, that's, that's the way it's going to go. Uh, so uh, we've just noticed that the, the equation for the parabola from earlier has the same form. e equals 1, and the thing I was calling a is r0. The equation for the hyperbola, which I'm not going to derive, I'm going to put that on the homework, is also exactly the same. But now, of course, uh, e is bigger than 1 for the hyperbola. So this is kind of the master equation, the kind of unified polar equation. For all conic sections. And that is a good place to stop.